my mother died. She was age 88, so it's not totally expect, unexpected. But for us, in a way, it was because the last several years she'd had a series of health troubles. She'd go in the hospital, have a procedure or surgery, and go back home. And that's what she expected this time. And all the rest of us kind of expected the same thing, but this time she didn't go home. And um, most of us uh, have mothers that uh, we know, not everybody, but uh, she was a big part of our, our lives. I'm just going to tell a little about her and tell one story. Um, she was from Oklahoma City. She was as mad as anybody I ever saw about um, Timothy McVeigh blowing up her block. That she was literally born there, where they later built the Murrah Building, so uh, right across the street from where they built the Murrah Building, and that was her neighborhood. Uh, she later uh, lived in Ponca City. Oklahoma, she uh, was uh, at the American Legion Homeschool, stopped going to school when she was 15, uh, married my dad uh, after she stopped going to school. Uh, she was uh, formally married when she was, uh, I don't know if she was 17 yet. She may have still been 16. That was lawful. Dad was 18. He had just graduated high school. They had been sweethearts since she was 14. Married 57 years till Dad died, and then she lived uh, another 14 years. Um, raised three children. Uh, my brother and sister and me. Um, and was buried in Punk City. Now, the story I'm going to tell, I was thinking about telling this story anyway because of the election's coming up. And in 1968, when I was attending Allison Junior High School in Wichita, Kansas, uh, that fall of 68, I had uh, an illness, uh, lung trouble, and um, I missed five weeks of school. And they were, they were just going to, they said, well, probably you're going to have to retake that. You're just going to, we're going to hold you back. It's possible you might make it up, make up some of it in um, uh, summer school. But my mother didn't want that. And she went and argued with him and said, look, he's been reading his textbooks. Just give him the tests and he'll pass them. And I made an A or B on every test. And this is in uh, late November, like Thanksgiving. You know, the semester is about over. And uh, so I passed them, but they said they I still had to do something more. They wanted me to write a paper. Now, I had never written a paper before, but my mother said, well, he's a good writer, so, you know, tell me what. And there was some negotiation, and uh, they, uh, they said, well... Um, have him write about the Electoral College. Now, November 1968, I should probably look up these numbers to find out the exact, but I'm just talking from memory. Uh, Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey almost tied in the popular vote, but uh, Nixon won easily in the Electoral College. Humphrey was second, and George Wallace was third. I believe he won five, the electoral college votes of five states. 
And um, so that was what everybody was talking about back in 1960, the fall of 1968. So, sure, I'll write about it. And they said, you have to uh, cite your sources, use quotes. So I uh, went to the Allison Junior High Library and found some very old history books. And I wrote my paper in pencil, didn't own a typewriter. And uh, they, you know, took my paper And um, then they called me in for a meeting, and my mother, and they had, they had questions, because nothing I wrote was what they taught. So the principal, history teacher, and what they called social studies teacher, went with me because my mom had gone home. She had other children to attend to, to the library, and I got out the books for them to show them. And uh, they agreed that everything I wrote was in these history books. So they passed me in all my courses, and uh, I didn't have to take summer school. Let me emphasize, I had no political agenda I am 12 years old. I just don't want to be held back or take summer school. Um, but when I returned, you know, after the Christmas break, uh, those books were all gone from the library. And they would not return my paper to me. And I'll tell you a little bit that was in the paper. Uh, and I've never been able to find those books. I'm going to show you a book here in a minute, a uh, history book, which does have some of the things I discussed. Um, in fact, why don't I show you that right now? This is in reverse. I don't, uh, I don't use this, so I don't know how to do it. This is uh, The Ascent of George Washington by John Furling. He's a historian. In fact, in the back of the book here, says he's a respected historian. And uh, two thousand nine. So, uh, talking about when George Washington first ran for office, there's four, four different governments he lived under. First, the Crown of England. Then the Revolutionary War government. Then after the Revolutionary War, uh, until the Constitution, we had different nations here. New Jersey was its own nation. It had its own army, its own navy, um, coined its own money, so did New York. All the former colonies were their own nation. And then after the Constitution, um, that's a new nation, the one we still live under, sort of. Uh, it's changed so much. Um, so I wrote that in my paper, and that's in any history book. That's what happened. In fact, one story that I, I've always been impressed with, uh, when George Washington first tried to get uh, his soldiers to swear allegiance to the United States, Many refused. They would say, New Jersey is my country. I don't know anything about the United States. So, times change. Now, here is uh, when 
George Washington. I'll probably take pictures of these and put them up in the video. Um, elections were not scheduled. That's in all four of these. Eventually, under the Constitution, you know, they scheduled elections. And that is in the Constitution. But in the three air, air arenas before that, they were called by each state was the elections were called by the governor. And uh, yeah, like now, usually they were some offices are every two years, some seven. So it varied. And uh, the other thing, if you were a white male property owner of sufficient property, you owned like a working farm, an apartment building, less than half of all white males could vote. But uh, you could vote in every county in which you owned sufficient property. Uh, and you had to vote in person, and you were fined if you didn't, which meant a lot of rich people had to pay fines. They were irritated with that. That's one reason that why they reduced the, uh, uh, the the rich people didn't want to have to get on a horseback and ride around a bunch of counties to vote. So uh, it wasn't for the reason a lot of people think, but no, they just... It was a convenience for rich people. Uh, when the Supreme Court in Reynolds v. Sims said one person, one vote, that was not based in law. That was just something they made up. That was not in the law anywhere. Um, and this Supreme Court might overrule that, say it was wrongly decided. So... Um, Uh, votes were public. No such thing as a secret ballot. That was That's fairly new. Uh, not yet 150 years old. So back in the 1700s, almost all the 1800s, it was still a public ballot. And that was to prevent fraud. And what one of these old books said was the new political parties, Democrats and Republicans, thought it would be easier to steal elections uh, if we had a secret ballot. And everyone who's looked into it believes that, but since the Democrats and Republicans control elections, they're not going to give up the secret ballot, and they're going to persuade you that's, that's what we should keep. Uh, I'm not sure any of these changes are for the benefit. Yeah any of them, but I'm of a minority opinion, and the main thing that they aspired to do, and they couldn't agree on how to do it, was to uh, require qualifications for candidates. A historian, not this one, um, but one of them I cited back in 1968 uh, was mostly about the government of the Roman Republic, the Cursus Anorum. Um, they, uh, like Caesar and Cicero, those guys were elected consul, uh, which would be the equivalent of our president and commander in chief. But what you had to do in ancient Rome was declare whether you were going to be a public person or a private person. Now, Rome was one city uh, with a established aristocracy. And so they could do this. Uh, I mean, if you, the historian, what he did, he, he went through the books of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and John Adams, these other leaders, yeah, they had marked all these things about the Roman Republic's Republic in books they owned, especially about the Cursus Honorum. But America was, was rural and spread out, and they just they weren't going to put that in the original Constitution. They thought they might get it in a 
amendment later. And then they're dealing with other issues. So that never happened. But in the Curse of Sonora, in ancient Rome, you had to declare as a teenage male whether you were going to be a public or a private person. And if you were going to enter into government. It wasn't called politics, it was government. And they... Um, um, you had to start with serving 10 years in the military. And you weren't going to be advanced unless you obtained a position of leadership. Um, and almost always, you had to fight in battles. You had to have actual combat experience. Which fortunately or unfortunately, they had. So, um, after 10 years, you could... Uh, I do have a note here somewhere. Um, yeah. Um, started off and ran for Questor. And... Uh, after your time in the military. Uh, that was a uh, office of uh, now civilian leadership, usually an aide to a governor or some other, what would we call like a cabinet official. And uh, if you successfully served your one-year term, where you often filled in for the governor, um, then you would uh, be admitted to the Senate. Now you'd be a backbencher. You would sit in the back and not speak, and you would move up over time. Uh, and then usually uh, you would work as an attorney. You would become a lawyer, and uh, you know you. So you have military background. A year in the as a quester. You're as a senator where you learned the law, and then you worked as a lawyer, uh, either or alternating public or private. You might prosecute. You might be a defense attorney, uh, civil laws. You learned business. Um, then you might become a judge, lower court judge. But once you had enough experience, then you ran for the office of Praetor, the highest judicial official. And um, after serving as a Praetor, you would be accept an appointment as a governor of a province that Roman conquered or somewhere. You would be a high uh, official. Sometimes you would be the authority. And then you would return to Rome and be a ranking senator. Um, sometimes serving as some kind of magistrate. Um, again, like uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs or uh, equivalent now to our chairman of the Joint Chiefs or cabinet secretary. Then you were eligible to run for president or consul. And uh, Caesar did that, Cicero did that. Now, then, since you were a public citizen, you uh, continued as a ranking senator, may again serve as a magistrate, you may even repeat as consul. Um, that is what Thomas Jefferson and um, George Washington, many of the early leaders wanted to eventually have here in the United States. So I put all that in my book, that the votes were public, that they were public and private citizens. You had this path to be eligible. I mean, remember, they weren't even eligible to run for consul until they had all this experience in, as military, uh, questor, praetor, senator, attorney. And uh, now, basically, um, you can be a 
con man or attorney general of California and become president. Uh, I expect, by the way, I'm a, uh, in 68, I learned about the electoral college. I ended up teaching political science as adjunct faculty for seven years. And um, I, uh, in 2008, I, was one of the 538. I was a member of the Electoral College uh, for Obama-Biden. So uh, that started when my mother suggested the Electoral College as the subject of my paper in 1968, and it set me off on a 40-year path to eventually become an, a member of the Electoral College. I was elected in convention in Kansas uh, in 1968. So, thanks mom. Job well done.